Okay, yes, I don't work for Historic England, so I'm, I, <laughs> I don't worry in quite the same way about what heritage is or what one does with it. Um, so, yes, I'm one of two Chris's. Chris, I'm Chris Gosden, and the, and the clever stuff that you'll see later on was put together by Chris Green. Um, I, my starting point, my end point in many ways, is that, that archaeology can and should address important issues. And there's few issues for me more important at the moment than inequality. So inequality is a, is a problem in the present, um, but it's a problem in the present that can be understood in a different way if we think about the, the history of inequality. So I'm developing a project uh, looking at inequality over the last thousand years um, from the Doomsday Book 1086 uh, onwards. And I'm using a whole bunch of stuff, which was um, much of which was created by English heritage as it then was, historic England as it now is, uh, which I think can be used in various ways to, to throw light on, on the notion of inequality. So um, some of the databases that I'll mention very briefly, which I think are important, the National Mapping Program, which is, is mapping the whole of England eventually, maybe, if, unless the money runs out. Um, the the um, historic landscape characterisation, which has looked at uh, the nature of the historic <coughs> landscape um, based on first edition ordnance survey maps. Uh, 500,000 listed buildings, which I think is an amazing um, resource, which often hasn't been used um, in, in terms of, of research and thinking about things, and then, and then stuff that is equally important but is not down to um, historic England, English heritage, um, the, the portable antiquity scheme being the, the main one. So, so part of my argument is that there's a whole raft of, of uh, material out there um, which can be used for, to allow us to think about the world of the past and the present in, in different ways. So inequality, this is um, from one of the more famous books on inequality, How the Other Half Lives, um, written right at the end of the, end of the 19th century when, when inequality was rife. Um, archaeologists have obviously thought about inequality in lots of different ways, but when they do so, they tend to think about things like the origins of inequality. When did, when did inequality start in human history? Was it the Paleolithic, Mesolithic, Neolithic or whatever? And there's been rather less discussion um, of, of places like England, so I'm going to talk specifically about England, um, in, over the last thousand years or so. I mean, obviously inequality has been much discussed by other disciplines, um, so this is a bit of an <coughs> economic historian's take on inequality, what this person did was look at uh, the, um, the, the, the costs of various different things, um, either what he calls the bare bones basket, the, the stuff that will just about keep you alive, or what he also calls the respectability basket, and, <coughs> and by looking at the costs of, of basic foodstuffs or slightly more luxurious stuff as against um, how people generated their own food or incomes, he was able to come up with notions of how many, what percentages of families were below the poverty line. Um, so 12, 90, almost 40% you know, of the population by this, this count was below the, below the poverty line. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the economics and the economic history around inequality has been fairly untheorised or, or fairly sort of crude in terms of, of, of how people have thought about inequality. So one of the most influential people, a guy called Milanovic, um, has looked at inequality over the last 5,000 years. He's an economic historian. And, and basically he sees a Malthusian um, cause of inequality as population goes up, um, which is to do with, in his view, um, a more beneficial climate, less disease, less war, less famine. When as population goes up, then inequality will also rise. And he has these long-term um, sort of wavelengths of inequality, which are basically driven by population, in his view. 
Um, this obviously leaves a heck of a lot out. Um, capitalism, for a start, which is, is let off the hook entirely. Um, so, so I think archaeology has a whole series of databases, but has a whole series of cultural sensibilities that can allow us to think about inequality in a much more nuanced and, and um, interesting way. What is inequality? So I would say inequality is not purely or, or solely an economic matter. It's more to do with people's ability to develop themselves in culturally acceptable ways, to develop their skills, to develop their social networks, to develop their, their personalities in ways that are, that are culturally acceptable at the time. Now, obviously, there are economic underpinnings of this, but I would, I would be inclined to take a more existential view of what inequality is ultimately. Um, in thinking about inequality, I've divided the issues up and the data up into, into three, and I'll talk about these, or all three of these more as the, the talk goes on. So first of all, there's what I call material, and that's to do with the combination of landscape and housing. Um, so yeah, over the last thousand years, the big issues are things like uh, the nature of enclosure, that who owns land? I mean, it's very interesting. Nobody knows who owns land in England. I mean, we, we could all find out what we own. Uh, but if you want to know what the really big landowners own, then that's much more difficult. Um, there are various sources, but they're, they're quite opaque. Um, so I'll talk a bit more about the, the combination of landscape and housing. What I call relational um, elements, so um, aspects of how, how individuals, how families, how groups relate to each other, and because this is archaeology, the relationships for me are through artefacts. Um, and here the, the PAS, the Portable Antiquities Scheme, is extremely important. There are something like um, 230,000 objects in the PAS which, which date from 1086 onwards, as we'll see. It's a tricky data set, but it's, a, it's potentially an extremely useful one. And then the last is um, embodied aspects of, of inequality. Uh, archaeologists have been surprisingly slow to pick up on the, the possibilities that the human body offers for understanding inequality. Economic historians have re realised over, over the last 20 years or so that the single best measure of inequality, or, or you know, lack of well-being, as it were, is height. If, you, if you're going to have one measure, um, it would be the, the height. And, and there's been quite a lot of economic history work done, as well. I'll show you a little bit later on, on, on the, the links between, well, it's basically nutrition and disease on the one hand, childhood disease, and height on the other. So if you're looking for a single measure, um, then height is there. But, but obviously there's a lot more that one could get out of um, an analysis of, of human bodies. And over the last thousand years, there are many, many, many thousands of, of human bodies, um, many of which have been relatively well excavated over the last 30 years or so. So we know quite a lot about the bodies, we know quite a lot about where they came from. So, so uh, the project that I'm conceiving of uh, we'll look eventually at the intersection of these, the, the landscape and housing on the one hand, the relational stuff, artefacts on, on the other, and the embodied nature, and to see whether these three different sets of information tell us the same story, almost certainly not, or, or rather different stories, and if they tell us different stories, how we make sense of those different stories. So I'll just take you through very briefly um, some elements of each of those things. So to start with landscape and, and housing, um, there has been a lot of work obviously done, um, and a lot of it within um, historic England, English heritage, on the nature of, of um, the rural landscape, the urban landscape, and so on, over the last thousand years. So Robertson Rathmore, this is a, a map taken from them. They looked at um, issues of, of nucleation and dispersal and came up with this notion of a central zone 
the, the bit that's shaded, which they said is much from the, the Anglo-Saxon period onwards, is much more nucleated. This is the, the England of, of <coughs> nucleated villages. And, and to either side of that, um, to, the, to the west, the southeast, and the, the north and west, then you generally get more dispersed settlement. And, and people like Andrew Lowry is now, have now, um, he's digitised a lot of their, their work and it's available in digital form so you can start to, to play around with it. And, and this provides a sort of a large scale backdrop. Uh, this, is, this is now Chris Green who who's, um, can use computers in a way that I certainly can't. Um, and, and what we've just been doing is, is playing around with some of the existing data sets. So these aren't in any way um, analyses in a sense, but they're just explorations of what one, what one can do. So he's taken the, um, the listed buildings that exist for the, for the period with English heritage, historic England, um, and, and extracted various forms of data on date on, on um, the, the nature of the building, those, those sorts of things. Um, and he started to map this stuff. Um, so not only is there a big, there's 500,000 listed buildings, but there's a large number, I can't quite remember what the number is, um, that have been dated directly by things like dendrochronology and so on. So there's, you can start to play around. So the scale um, up there, um, the purpley colours are, are the 11th century through to the yellow colours which are the 20th century, so unsurprisingly the 20th century dominates, but you can, you can start to play around with when, when building occurred in various parts of the country, which bits of building are, are preserved. And we've been very influenced in this work by someone who up until quite recently worked for English Heritage, a man called Jeremy Lake. And he was interested in um, the waves of investment in the countryside, uh, where, where and when people invested in um, buildings. Um, and he was also interested in, in not just the fabric of the buildings, the nature of the buildings, but also the, the density of buildings and linking that building, uh, those buildings to the predominant character of the landscape. And what he was what he contrasted very broadly um, in, are things like parliamentary enclosed landscapes, where, where landscapes were enclosed through acts of parliament of various different kinds. And these were often much sparser in terms of things like farmsteads, people were driven off the land, big estates came into being, and, and, and older buildings were destroyed. So one can look at um, patterns of investment, patterns of, of, um, of acts of parliament to, to take land out of, of some people's hands and put it into others. So this again is Chris playing around, this is an animation of um, the listed buildings of different <coughs> centuries, so we've just gone into the 13th century, so the darker it is, uh, the more buildings they are, 14th century, and we can see places like um, southern East Anglia and across the Midlands coming out, Kent uh, appears as the, as the 15th century appears. And, and, and like I say, we wouldn't, we wouldn't put any eventual store on this, there are all sorts of problems with the data, but, but what I want to show is that there are possibilities of thinking in these terms of patterns of investment. We need to think more critically about what lies behind some of these patterns, but we're convinced that there are really interesting things in there that we can look at, um, landscape, investment, a whole range of things. And he's done the same with the PAS. Uh, PAS is even more problematical. Um, so this is the 12th century, 12th century material from the PAS. You can see you can see that places like the Isle of Wight stand out very heavily. That's not probably because there was much more metal work in the Isle of Wight than elsewhere. It's probably because there are more metal detectorists in the Isle of Wight. So, <laughs> so there, are, there are all sorts of other patterns there. But, but again, once one critiques these things, there are a whole range of possibilities for thinking about um, the, the ways in which people had access to artefacts and, and material culture and, and uh, some sort of spatial and, and temporal patterning. So this is, again, 
they're playing around with PAS data of different periods. So the yellow stuff is 18th to 20th century. This purpley stuff is, is 15th to 17th. And, and, the, and the data are complex, the patterns are complex, but there are, you, you can start to see different, um, different patterns coming out. And the northern towns, for instance, emerge um, from the 18th century onwards in these data. And then here, you know, it's got a bit out of sync for some reason, but, but here is a, a comparison of the, of the listed buildings on the one hand and the PAS, oh yeah, it's back in sync now on the other. And, and so there are complex contrasting um, patterns in, in a building of, of enclosure, but also of, of <coughs> artifact use. I'll just let this play through a, a, a little bit more. And, 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 and so there's, there, there is a lot more that one could do once you get into HER records, once you get into um, urban database records to, to really nuance all these um, all these sorts of things so that's that's um, the historic landscape the nature of, of investments in enclosure who has access to to basic landscapes on the one hand but also access to patterns of artifact use and then and then bodies uh, so uh, this is the change in male height in various countries from 1825 through to 2000 and one could link, it's interesting to see. Uh, so the US, for instance, male height went up a lot, but over the last um, few decades, it started to drop off as, as inequality has really taken hold in places like the States. And here you have, this is female height on a world scale, um, plotted against the so-called Gini coefficient. Gini is, is the, the most used single measure of, of income inequality. Um, so a Gini of naught, so this is 0.55, a Gini of naught would mean that the income was perfectly distributed, everyone has the same amount. A Gini of one would mean that it, all, the, all the wealth is concentrated in single hand. Um, and, and so then these are, these are more equal societies, these are less equal societies, and you can see broadly the trend line is that people get smaller with, with greater inequality. Um, there, are, there are various ways in which one can nuance these data, so there are, uh, Neil will know, know this, um, places like Hungate is, is, was a, a 19th and 20th century slum, had, had um, <coughs> excavations as re have revealed skeletons from earlier periods, and one can contrast different bits of, of a city like York, but certainly of London and, and various other places where we know the background of people. And one thing I've got really excited about, and only archaeologists can get excited about this sort of stuff, is tooth plaque. Um, tooth plaque is, is just starting to be fully analysed, um, and potentially it can, t and, and all previous populations had loads of it, it's only us lot that has it, have it removed. Um, tooth plaque can tell you about diet, um, both in terms of what goes down, but there's also various reflux actions, but also it can tell you about illness. Um, so so the, the microbial analysis of plaque can tell you quite a lot about the two of the basic aspects of well-being, um, how much you get to eat on the one hand and how sick you were on the other hand. So there's the possibility of combining various aspects of um, skeletal evidence through from the, the, the fairly gross um, statistics on height, uh, but also wear on joints and various things, how much people had worked and how, what sort of work they did through to, to um, direct evidence, tricky evidence, but direct evidence on, on diet and disease. The idea that I'm playing around <coughs> with is that, um, so, so looking at the last thousand years, I mean, the broad contrast is between a feudal society on the one hand and an emerging industrial and capitalist society on the other hand. Uh, the, the notion of the industrial revolution um, is, is a question and how far it was revolutionary. Um, there's more and more evidence from the, the, from the late medieval period onwards. There was a considerable free peasantry, people who weren't tied to the land, uh, 
uh, proto-industrial forms, um, particularly in the northern or around the northern towns. Uh, the, the development of mass consumption from the, the 16th century onwards uh, and greater influence of money. There's, there's what's also known as the Industrious Revolution, um, which is said to have occurred in the 16th century. Prior to that, um, people would work as hard as they needed in order to meet their material needs and then they'd stop working. There was no notion that you'd accumulate a surplus. After, after the Industrious Revolution in the 16th century, people would keep working in order to get more, in order to consume more. Uh, so there are a whole range of, of things. So one thing that we'd like to do is to critique and nuance uh, the notion of the, of the Industrial Revolution and the contrast between the medieval world and the, and the, and the industrial world. Um, and we feel that, that the archaeology that's been accumulated through a you know, very considerable amount of, of public investment in, in bodies like Historic England can allow us to do this. And by combining evidence from the landscape and the built environment, um, artefacts and the body, then we could start to think about inequality in, in a whole series of different ways. Okay, I'll leave it there.